Well, th thank you. I'm, um, I was asked to present actually the Artemis uh, biopsy procedure itself, and I'm somewhat humbled standing here trying to present it in front of uh, Dr. Marks. We have an experience. Uh, our experience, I actually started trying to buy, you asked about purchasing a second ago, trying to buy the Artemis device in about 2009, shortly after Dr. Marks, and finally was able to get the purchase order in about 2010. And our database now consists of about 2,000 patients. The first about 1,000 I threw out because actually our MRIs were good, but as I discussed the other day, our ultrasound machine was 10 years old and I was not getting good ultrasonography to marry up with it. And so I essentially have thrown out that data. But at this stage, we have about close to the same number of biopsies, probably a little shorter than that, and about a 2,000 uh, patient database with this. And so I was gonna show you how I do the Artemis biopsy and I'd love for Dr. Marks to provide uh, additional comments on it. I have absolutely no relationship with Artemis. They don't pay anything for me. They haven't given me anything. I'm not on a speaker bureau or anything for it. Um, but I have used all the devices. Back when we were trying to, to decide which device to begin using, I brought in um, uh, the Coelis, the Euronav when it was very new. Um, we even had a target scan for a while, I don't know if you remember the target scan, before we finally decided on the Artemis. And despite lots of um, uh, marketing from Philips and Invivo to try to get into the Euronav, I have uh, stuck with the Artemis. The first thing, the first thing about the uh, Artemis device is that it is an Enfire probe, and so a lot of physicians are not familiar with the Enfire probe, and you have to learn how to move the Enfire probe and pushing the probe away to get to the base, pulling it back to get to the apex. There's only a single chip in there so that you have to turn it in order to get to the sagittal view and raise your hand up to get down to the left side of the prostate and drop your hand down to get to the right side of the prostate. And just that movement alone, when I bring the fellows in to try to do this, I actually just have them put their hand on there and we go through scanning the prostate and seeing what we can see together, mostly to get them used to using an Enfire probe as opposed to an ultrasound probe. Now one of the things, I'm just gonna pause real quickly, one of the things that people complain about the Artemis device that after you get over this, I, I think it's, it's simple and you can see how quickly I, I dock the uh, ultrasound probe into it but it's the use of this mechanical arm as opposed to having it in your hand. And there's a couple of tricks to just, to, to quickly dock this into it. I'll do up to 15 of these biopsies, and I do it under sedation, but I'll do up to 15 of these in a day, and just as Dr. Mark said, it takes about 15 minutes, even with the docking of the, um, of the robotic arm to the um, uh, ultrasound probe. So you want to put the ultrasound probe right where you want the uh, image to be obtained from the prostate, and then move the, the mechanical arm to match the ultrasound probe. Don't try to match the ultrasound probe to the mechanical arm. You want to have it in the proper position. After you've got it in the proper position in the sagittal view, or in the uh, transverse view, I turn it to the sagittal view here so that I can see the entire urethra throughout the um, prostate itself. When we do, and, and here's a, you know image of the entire urethra in the sagittal view. Once I know I can see the entire urethra, I know I have it in the proper plane you know, from left to right, and I then want to adjust it using one of the mechanical arms so that it's in the exact middle of the prostate between the base and the apex. And you can see as I slide the, prostate, slide the ultrasound probe over the prostate in order to get it into the middle. And you can adjust the pressure that you're putting on the uh, prostate so that you might marry up better with your MRI itself. Once you have that done, then the ultrasound probe sits there. And that's one of the things I love about the Artemis is my hands are free. My, and I, I have some Italian me and I talk, I talk a lot with my hands and everything so I don't have to worry about holding the ultrasound probe just where I had it there. And especially if you're doing computer work, if you're doing computer work, your hand always tends to drift somewhere if you're over on the computer and all of a sudden you come back and you don't have the same image that you had before. With the Artemis device and this whole robotic setup, it's going to stay right there. And, and what I'm trying to point out here is that what you end, end up doing with the Artemis device is gathering up a whole series of images. So once you have it into the, um, the cradle for the ultrasound, for the uh, Artemis device itself, you're going to rotate this handle down here. Is this running? Yeah. You're going to rotate this handle down here so that you collect up a series of coronal images. 
And the computer is, is, is taking in all this information. You know, it's a big, I used to go to meetings where they had a lot of calculus up there and doing a lot of um, integral, integral equations so that you could take this entire image and then this top image becomes a computer generated image. So we never had a sagittal image just like that. The computer generated this image in silica from all of the images that we gathered in the coronal view. And much of what you work with in order to um, put your um, uh, MRI and ultrasound fusion together in the right place are these computer generated images. They have a different quality than what your live image will have down here. What I do there, I'll just back up first, well no. What I do there is I go and I find the widest portion of the prostate um, and in the coronal view, and then that jumps me immediately to the transverse view where you're gonna outline the prostate in general in order to tell the computer where to begin looking for the prostate. You do that first in the transverse view, then you're gonna do it in the sagittal view here and outline the borders here. And this becomes a bit like uh, playing with uh, 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 you know, Adobe Photoshop where you're going to, to monitor or you're, where you're going to alter the borders of the prostate as you go. And so then with it, with, you get this 3D rendering. And this is the first opportunity for the, the uh, computer that Dr. Marx pointed out sitting in the base of this Artemis device to take all of these images and generate a real 3D model of the prostate. Over on the the radiologic side, they have software, in this case a, a program called Profuse, that does that same sort of 3D modeling with the MRI image. And so what you're trying to get is two 3D models that you're then going to um, merge together. Um, this, is the, this is the playing with the uh, Photoshop here in order to get the margins of the prostate correct in the transverse view going up to the base, scrolling between the base and the apex in the transverse view. <clears throat> Hopefully I'm doing this okay as Dr. Marx is, is watching. <laughs> Sorry, this is sort of the uh, slow part. I should speed this up if I can. And then you're gonna do it in the sagittal view here so that you have it on both, both parts. And then, whoop, um, this is the three, whoops, let me back that up real quick because I lost my words here. Ah. See, technology, that's the thing about playing with any, you have to be patient with your uh, technology if you're an early adopter. Come on. So this is where you get your first 3D rendered model of the prostate in silica. And you can actually rotate this prostate around. This is the first time that you import the MRI into the computer software itself. And then this is where you attempt to do some rigid uh, alignment. And what you essentially are gonna do is tell it in X, Y, and Z space where the prostate is located. And this is going too fast here, sorry. Okay, hold on, let me stop this here, sorry. <laughs> this is the first time I've done this movie like this. So once you have it lined up like this, you're then gonna try to tell it in X, Y, and Z space where the alignment of the prostate, both the MRI model and the ultrasound model are. And there's a number of different uh, anatomic uh, locations you can use. I do find that you, if you can, using the apex, uh, the urethra where the apex of the prostate is and the bladder neck tend to be good for the um, uh, sagittal alignment and that tends to be the most important one. You're then going to use the base of the, or the posterior capsule of the prostate to tell it, uh, to get it aligned in the X plane. And then I do like to use the coronal view. Some people don't, the company says you don't need to, but I do like to use the coronal view. And again, I use the urethra and the, um, the, the neck of the, uh, the bladder neck in order to line it up in the Z axis there. Um, the computer then, then gets these two 3D models of the prostate and lines them up. And this is the first time that you start to see the regions of interest. 
And once you see the regions of interest with the fused models there, you can um, start um, uh, looking towards planning your uh, biopsy here. And you can see how um, within the model up top, which is the computer generated model and the ultrasound image below, you can see these things. So now, now you're ready to start doing the biopsy and using the information that you have already put into it to move your prostate. Let me back that up for just a second here. To move the probe to find your thing. So one thing I want to point out is that this, this is off just slightly. I would rather have this uh, pivot rotation a little bit further towards the apex here uh, because it's just going to give me a, a broader ability to reach all aspects of the prostate if I'm pivoting right on the middle of the prostate. But once you have it in place there, the computer, the mechanical arm, will help you to move right to the location that you want to biopsy. So in this case, I always go for the regions of interest first. And then it has something called a motion compensation, which I can use to then marry up the, the image that the, pro, that the computer thinks that it's working off of with the live image and adjust the prostate and adjust the um, uh, targeting in real time in order to have better alignment between the, the constructed image that the computer is working off of to tell you where to biopsy and the real-time image. This is especially important if the patient moves. As I said, I do it under some propofol sedation for um, humanity's sake um, because it's, it's, it's tough to lay there for 15 minutes and we have a system that allows it. Once you take the biopsy, you will, you will see the biopsy come through on the ultrasound and the machine will actually label th that biopsy track right where you took the, the, the core itself. It sees the flash on the bottom, and then it'll put a, a, a line on the top there in order for you to maintain, as Dr. Marx was saying, a, a history of exactly where that biopsy came from. The same thing happens, you know, we can go down here, start hitting the uh, lower risk lesion here, the Pyrads 3 lesion here. I have the uh, uh, motion compensation for all of my uh, regions of interest. I do motion compensation once I get to the uh, area in order that I uh, 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 you know, feel more confident that I am uh, hitting the exact area that the computer wants me to hit. And then we go ahead and take the biopsy. And again, you'll see on the bottom, you'll see the flash of the needle. And up top, there was a little red line, I, I highlighted it there in order for you to be able to see where the computer generates the uh, flash of the needle that it'll then store that you can then bring back into the system. And after you do your targeted biopsies, just as Dr. Marks was saying earlier, I still think it's incredibly important to go about and get your systematic biopsies. There is a lot of information, both for an educational purpose for you and your um, uh, radiologist to learn from doing these biopsies, and the MRI is clearly not perfect. As, as Dr. Marks has uh, pointed out and is, is, is in our database, and we've done uh, not as good of a job of publishing, uh, it, it clearly 30% of M MRI uh, 30% of tumors are missed on MRI. And so you can go around here. The other nice thing about this is we all know that whenever you're doing a handheld transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, you tend to oversample and undersample regions of the prostate. Especially, I mean, at least for me, I'm going to be honest, when the patient starts getting uncomfortable and I'm trying to get a biopsy down by the prostate, eventually I'm just trying to come up with prostate, down by the apex, eventually I'm just trying to come up with prostate tissue. And so by using a device like this, even if you're using in a, in a gentleman who doesn't have any regions of interest, I think it helps space out your prostate biopsies better. It's going to help you prevent oversampling or undersampling of, the, of any regions of the prostate, even in men who have uh, MRI uh, negative findings. So you go through all of this, gather up all of your biopsies here, and that's pretty, it, pretty much it. Um, this is just another example of it, again showing the movement of the hand in order to do the end fire ultrasound. The docking of the robot, it's from another angle. You raise the robot arm up in order to meet the ultrasound probe where you want it. You're going to align it in the, um, uh, uh, 
sagittal view in the middle of the prostate. You're then going to take your 360 degree uh, images from the prostate that the computer is going to use to generate all of your different uh, images that you're going to plan from. It then renders it in uh, uh, 3D. You do all of your adjustments so that you have good margins. And one of the things that we've been looking at is whether or not the volume of the prostate, and this is going to be a true volume of the prostate, not a calculated volume of the prostate based on you know uh, transverse uh, length and height of the prostate with an uh, ellipsoid uh, or bullet uh, calculation. This is a true volume. And one of the things we've been looking at is whether if you're off in your volumes between your radiologist and your um, uh, ultrasound, is that going to impact your ability to hit your targets and such? And again, you have all of your targets lined up. In this case, we have an anterior target. The ultrasound pivots in the, the right place in the middle. Again, from this position, from this angle, you can see how you move the uh, mechanical arm in order to line yourself up with the uh, actual biopsy uh, site. And then you go ahead and take your biopsies. And again, the ultrasound machine or the, uh, will uh, record where all of those biopsies are. And as Dr. Marks was mentioning, you can then import that back in. And I've had patients where you import that information back into the, uh, uh, a future biopsy. So say a patient comes back in two or three years, they have a new lesion on MRI that you didn't identify previously, and you can import this information back in and go, well, we didn't find that lesion because I can clearly see here that none of my needles, even my random needles, hit that area of the prostate. And sure enough, now that you have a lesion there, you can go and do a targeted biopsy and you'll end up finding the cancer right there. So that is important in understanding how you might have had a negative biopsy in the past, you didn't take any samples from it, and now two, three years later you have an MRI that shows a lesion and you're able to hit that area to identify the cancer. Thank you very much for your time.